Well, thank you all very much. Um, what an act to follow. Uh, that was a spectacular talk, uh, all about the arts and their importance in the city. And to talk about arts in the city, to talk about um, innovation and creativity in the city is, however, impossible without also talking about this, public meetings. <laughs> um, some of you may know me as the head of this architecture school here. Others may know me as someone who has been involved in the public review process uh, for lots of projects in this area. And it's very interesting. Um, the public review process is actually, you know, many architects, many designers don't like it. They want to be able to um, execute their vision. But the truth is, um, there's a reason why public review takes place. There's a reason why we have to integrate participatory democracy with the design of our cities. That has not been the case throughout most of human history. But in the last 50 years, it started. Um, Boston is, uh, there are a number of odd things about Boston when it comes to this challenge. One of them is, um, we think of, when we say Boston, we really mean the Boston metropolitan area. <laughs> because Boston itself, as you know, is a very, uh, politically a very small place. Um, and it's small for several reasons that many of you probably know. Um, the city was founded almost 400 years ago, and as a result, um, places like Cambridge seemed really far away and they should be different cities. Of course, now, we don't think that. And in fact, even 100 years ago, people didn't think that when they conceived of um, uh, uh, c combining all of the cities and towns that you see on this map, uh, basically 10 miles out from the center of the city into a single uh, city. That didn't happen. <laughs> but the need for us to think of the region as a political whole was clear even then. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because the public review process, the public meetings that we go to, are a manifestation of uh, how to deal with change. And a city like Boston um, has actually undergone, we think of it sometimes as staid and resistant to change, but actually, that's not true at all. <laughs> There's probably no American city that has transformed itself more than Boston through its history. There are lots of different versions of this diagram that many of you may have seen, but the, the, the little gray outline in the middle is the original Shawmut Peninsula. Um, then, in the mid-19th century, there's a larger Boston outlined in blue, and finally the one outlined in red is more or less the city we know today. But the contours, the physical contours of the city, have transformed utterly throughout its history. This is the North End in 1923, and you can tell a very salient feature about this picture of the North End if you're familiar with Boston's history. Boston is surely the only city that has had a catastrophic molasses flood. Um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and that barrel you see up there on the left is filled with molasses that would, in a short while, all spill and cause all kinds of havoc. But the cities change. And as you, you know, here is a, here's an example of some of the change that is not welcome to everyone in the city. Um, this is how some of that change happened. It looks like thermonuclear war, but it's actually urban renewal. Um, and what you see are things like the central artery plowing through the historic fabric of this mercantile city, which we often forget in the 1950s was a sleepy place with few economic prospects. So there was a reason why change was called for. And this was the change we got. Now, again, whether you like it or not, this change <laughs> played a significant and important economic role in the evolution of the city. Um, it was accompanied by further devastation. This is the, 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 the elimination of most of the West End. I could also show you pictures of Lower Roxbury, which was similarly devastated by urban renewal. <laughs> but some of the upsides of this were that the so-called New Boston that was exemplified by the uh, transformation of government center in the 1960s made way for the real New Boston that we know, which is the economic vitality of Boston's downtown core over the last several decades. What we're faced with now is a changing public process. 
Up until the 1960s, um, large-scale change in, in this city and other cities um, wasn't done in close collaboration with lots of citizens. <clears throat> Not at all. <laughs> it was done by a few people, uh, often experts, and by the way, often with sometimes very good results. Um, they didn't do a poll um, to determine the shape of the emerald necklace that we heard about earlier. Uh, you know, that was done by a professional, uh, thankfully a good one. Uh, but our politics and democracy demands a level of public participation. What we have to learn how to do, the challenge that we face, is that we have to find a way to make that public communication more effective. Because we have not yet succeeded. We have succeeded in, in involving the public in a much bigger way in how we develop our city. What we have not yet done is figure out how to do it um, optimally. So this is something that we are taking on very seriously at, at the School of Architecture that I had because I think it's probably the most important single variable in the future of, our, of this city and other cities. Um, the, the, this, is, this is the world's shortest history of, of, of how this all happened, but to make it very brief, there was, uh, because uh, there were major things happening, like the uh, images I showed you before, like the tearing down of Penn Station in New York, people were, uh, citizens were appalled that they had no say in the shape, of, the shape of their future city. As a result, there was significant activism and protest that was successful and stopped things, as many of you in the audience know, things like the Interbell Expressway, and replaced it with investment uh, in, trans in public transportation that was much more uh, suitable for uh, maintaining the character of the city. But the uh, uh, consequences of this whole evolution of the public review process established a kind of uh, battle between the downtown and the neighborhoods, which is one narrative. Uh, another is the elimination of what they call as of right zoning, might not sound Interesting, Brunelleschi probably didn't have to deal with it, but uh, as of right zoning meant, uh, means in many cities that uh, there is a plan, and as long as you adhere to the plan, you're allowed to build according to the plan. Because we were so unhappy with the results of de urban development in the 60s, uh, we said we don't want you building anything as of right. We want you to talk to us as a community, no matter what you build. And this is a, a very rational outcome, it seems to me. Uh, there was a significant loss of public trust about what the uh, built environment was going to look like. Um, what has, it has um, transformed into a kind of politics uh, by other means. In other words, there's a lot of issues that get discussed in public meetings now. Some of them have to do with buildings and the built environment. Some of them have to do with other things. Also very understandable. Um, whoops, sorry. So these new, what are these new battles about? Anybody who's been to a public meeting will recognize these terms. They're about height, they're about bulk, various uses, they're about congestion, they're about the character of the neighborhood, they're about demographics, who is gonna live here? Is it gonna be different? Um, they're about profit. And what we really need then is um, a set of tools that help us make, have this communication be more effective. And at the School of Architecture, one of the things we're really trying to do is understand that there is not, as with many things, there is not, this is not a black and white issue. This is not an all or nothing issue. Public participation is essential, but it needs to be um, useful and helpful and constructive public participation. Professional expertise is also essential because some of the challenges we face are technically culturally and aesthetically complicated and are hard to manage as a group. So we're, we're looking at new visualization tools that allow us to make use of data about the, the big picture, about the big picture of our region, about the ecology of our city. About, and, and when I say our city, I mean that 10 mile <laughs> diagram that I was talking about before. That is our region. Um, and in order to do that, we need ways to measure how our big choices reflect, are reflected in the little choices that we actually get to make. We don't get to make giant regional decisions. What we make are decisions about a building in your neighborhood or a building in your neighborhood or a building in your neighborhood. And 
what we don't have yet is a way to synthesize that information and, and have it inform the small choices that we make. So what we're working on is, is this little thing here. It's an iPad uh, tool that would allow all citizens who wanted to participate in the public review process to use it to look at a proposed development project from their own point of view, from their own perspective, as they walk around their neighborhood. There would be an image of the development project on the screen about which they could comment, and that would be registered on a website, and so everyone, not just four or five people, everyone could participate, and we would have a much more uh, statistically significant contribution by the community that could be used it, 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 to accelerate and clarify the development process. What I'm talking about is improved communication, because when there's a lack of trust, the thing that you need is communication. Um, this is not going to be easy. We're going to continue developing this tool, but I like to think of what Horace Greeley said in the 19th century, the, the New York newspaper man, who said that the way we do things is to begin. <laughs> Thank you very much.